might just be me, but I think there's a huge appeal in a game that meaningfully reflects your decisions. And so if yeah. every time you play through, you see that, like, I did this thing differently and everything changed, then that right there is going to make you want to keep replaying it you to see what? what you can possibly That do. is so huge to me. The false choice. I am sick <laughs> of the false choice in video games. This we got backward compatible. Jim, Doc, and Chris talk about the game design of Westworld and discuss whether it's possible to create the same open-ended experience in a video game. Plus, impressions of Prey, news about Sonic Forces, and a new reading list. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 101 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy, guys. And we're joined and by... And gals. <laughs> and we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. Ah, see? There you go. But it's, we're inclusive here on the podcast. I should say, before we move on, guys, gals, and furries, this will come up later. <laughs> You're welcome to stay. It will. Yes. Oh, my. And Doc, do you want to introduce our media topic and discussion? Yeah, today we're talking about not furries. <laughs> no, 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 we are. We'll, we'll, are we'll see. we? Okay. Yes, later on. All right, well, um, we're, we're talking about soulless creatures um, who have uh, uh, sort of a, an ability to walk around autonomously. We're, of course, talking about, uh, well, actually not talking about Westworld. If you've, if you've seen the show Westworld, we're not going to do any spoilers for, for Westworld because, frankly, it's just not even worth watching. It's pretty terrible. But <laughs> That's a pretty cool fact. I, I love the way they, um, they set up the world, like the, 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 the um, what I'm looking for. Yeah, just the sets, the set the world dressing, building, all of that, yeah. the world building, the costume. But uh, w- when, the, what, when they did wear clothes, that's to be fair. Well, yeah, that's about half the time. Yeah, about half the time, <laughs> right? <laughs> but what what we really want to talk about is that Westworld is about a game. Fundamentally, mm-hmm. it's it's about the idea of a game, and it's about a type of game that we haven't really seen um, playably in 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 the real world. And so the question on the table today is. Could such a game exist? And if it did, what would it look like? So there we go. Stay tuned. Uh, But first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. All right. Well, I've been playing uh, Prey lately. When I say lately, I mean uh, for about all of one week. Uh, Prey actually released back in uh, the beginning of May, so about a month ago. And... um, I picked it up a couple of, couple of weeks ago and had some issues, which I'll get into playing it um, when it first came out. Uh, but, I, but now that those issues have been fixed, um, I'm actually enjoying the experience quite a bit. Uh, give a little background here. Prey was uh, built by Arcane Studios, which y'all might remember from Dishonored, the mm-hmm. Dishonored series. Yeah. Um, and it actually was, was meant to be the spiritual successor to System Shock. So it's, it's essentially you're inside this... Um, space station known as Talos-1, or moon base, rather, known as Talos-1, um, in an alternate future. And um, you're, you are a scientist that has been developing essentially this um, neuromods, I believe they're called, but essentially it's, it's enha- like neuro enhancements to give you special abilities, extra abilities that could potentially damage damage your memory when they try to remove them and stuff like that. Call However, them what they are, Jim. They're plasmids. Well, not exactly, actually, no, because it's things like it gives you, say... Now you know how to hack into a system, or now you know how to, um, um, you, your ability to use medical kits is better. So it's a lot of his attributes right now. There are psi abilities that are like plasmids, but I haven't even gotten to that point yet. Okay. So they're later in the game. So neuromods right. are a little different. Of course, I'm referring to Bioshock, yes, which, which is, was also a spiritual successor, if you will, to System mm-hmm. Shock. And that was arguably, arguably even a sequel because it was by the same... Um, company, same people worked on it. Ken Levine, right, uh, did worked on that's, System that's Shock very Two true. and Bioshock. Well, and since it's been established in Infinity that all of those worlds are accessible through lighthouses, um, yes. But see, I don't, I don't believe that. If, I don't, I don't accept it. In Bioshock spoiler, Infinity, by the way, <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I don't accept Bioshock Infinity as actually being a part of the same universe itself. So. We'll just move whatever right. helps you sleep at night with your repressed <laughs> memories, Jim. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and actually, but that element of of amnesia plays a central role in 
like losing your memories after you use, after trying to have neuromods uninstalled plays a central role in Prey. Because in Prey, the scientist that, you're, um, that is your avatar within this game um, kind of has this total recall moment where oh. he realizes very early on... You mean Arnold Schwarzenegger, total recall, yes. you got, wait, uh, Quaid, you got to save Mars, all that stuff? Yes. Wow. In the sense that um, he realizes, um, uh-oh, I have been reliving the same day thinking it's you know one day, but really it's been multiple days in my life because I'm kind of a test subject here. And... Oh, it seems like it was myself that set that set this up as a test subject. Myself as a test subject, I volunteered for it, or did I? And then you start to, you you start to get video recordings of yourself that's trying to help you out on this mission. That is very total so, recall. Yeah, and mm-hmm. in fact, your your biggest um, ally is basically a computer. And I'm not really spoiling much. This, this is all like first thirty minute stuff. Um, is it in the demo? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your your. Um, it's like this computer program known as January, this AI, that is essentially a repository for all of your memories before you started undergoing these procedures. So it's almost like you're talking to yourself, like an AI version of yourself. Oh, that's neat. And then, of course, you actually get recordings from yourself. Um, your brother is involved as well. Essentially, essentially, you were sent to this base in order to test out and develop and um, enhance these neuromods and improve them to do what I was kind of inferring to before, the psi abilities. Um, the game starts off with all of these tests where you go into this room and you're supposed to, um, the scientists say, okay, just push that button over there as fast as you can. Just, just do, do it however you feel would be the quickest to do it. Like try not to like lure you to do it one way or the other. And of course the implication is they're expecting you to do things like use your mind to move boxes or use your mind to push a button. Don't push the red button. Right. Whatever you do. But you can't because you don't have those abilities. So you're so you're literally just it's kind of comical. You're like you have to run up and actually physically push a box. Oh, that's hilarious. And they just kind of start the like, scientists start looking around like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> What's happening? Because for whatever reason your your those abilities aren't working that particular day. They're supposed to be. You're supposed to be getting better and better at them throughout this 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 procedure. And then of course, um, it, it you basically break through the simulation very early on, and now the whole thing is to figure out what's going on in the in the base because within this base there are these creatures called mimics, and they could look like anything. So it creates this very tense atmosphere where you're exploring, you see a shiny object. Oh, it's a video game. Shiny object means go pick up. It's something cool. Well, it might be a mimic, and if it's a mimic, they they look like kind of a cross between like a shadow and a spider. But they can also kind of like sit up on their on their legs and like flail at you. They're kind of these weird sort of. Um, We've all played D and D, Jim. We know what mimics are. Yes, but they don't look like that. They, they look like this weird. <laughs> Wait, you're telling me a mimic doesn't look like a specific thing? Mimic, uh, mimic in D and D for me is a little tre- the treasure chest with the with the with the teeth, the and teeth, and yeah. Anyway, you say that, but uh, when the table laughs, dot dot dot. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, no, but the, it, it creates this very tense experience because you don't know when you're going to get it, when you are going to be attacked, and they can kill you pretty quickly. You do start off the game with just just a, a heavy wrench as your weapon. No, um, that get, has to be an no, homage. No, of course, of course it is. And you do get very quick, very quickly. You get a gun known as a glue gun. You later get real guns, by the way. But your first <laughs> your first gun is a glue gun. And this, I call it's called glue, is in G L O O. I forget what it stands for. Oh, okay. But it shoots out essentially this almost like a like a cement like substance that will harden creatures when it hits them. Oh, interesting. So you can like sort of cover the the mimics in cement, and then you can attack them for f- while they're trying to struggle to get out. It's probably for patching holes or something. Yes, you use, you use it for for solving puzzles. Like you can actually use it to um, if there's say a a. a, a, a a pipe that bursts and like there's flames shooting out of it. You can use it to plug it up or you can use it to, you can shoot things. Then you can try to actually climb on top of the goo Mm -hmm. and get to higher areas, stuff like that. Um, There's also these other creatures that that get basically taken over by mimics. So people can get killed by mimics or taken over by mimics and they become these like large shadowy creatures that shoots, that shoot like mind bullets at you or something. So it's, it's really a tense game. I would consider it a, um, Almost a combination of a survival horror experience and um, an adventure game. So it definitely kind of scratches that itch of if you're looking for another System Shock 2 or Bioshock, it has a very similar feel to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does have a lot of little 
touches to the 80s as well, which you'll pick up on when okay. you get into it from the uh, from the demo. That's cool. But it's a really interesting game, and I'm not super far into it. I'm starting to get into the, the environment, which is sort of a... They call it open world, but you're all inside one space station. Mm-hmm. So it's more like you're, you're, the space station is kind of a sandbox for you. Well, again, Bioshock was the same station. way. <laughs> right. And and Bioshock was the same way. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting space that you can kind of explore... In whatever order you want to, but if, but there is like one driving story that you can choose to pursue, um, or not. That's interesting. So. Well, I've already downloaded the demo, but I haven't fired it up yet. You're making me want to do that. But what I hope it's not is another Dead Space because I I just didn't enjoy that series. No, I I do think it does try to capture some of those horror el- horror aspects of Dead Space. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it does have that. You're really not that powerful. You can die pretty quickly. Right. Um, Elements is a big part of the game, but I do think it handles it better than Dead Dead Space. Okay, so as long as I'm not counting more. bullets. No, but you're not really relying on your guns most of the time. You're you're oh, relying you on your wits. Yeah, I saw uh, some. Uh, like I haven't seen much of the game, but I did see someone on Twitter post like their solution to a puzzle mm-hmm. where they like put a bunch of stuff on a cart and like wheeled the cart over to this thing and then like pushed something through like a small open window. And then, like, I forget it exactly. They might have, like, possessed and then, like, sort of popped back out once the thing was through the window mm-hmm. in order to push the button. Wow. Uh, so, like, some really interesting possible solutions. Okay. That must be a lot so. farther along than I am. Probably has some side build. I'm only about two and a half hours in. Okay. And that kind of will transition us into uh, my, my next segment, which is kind of about prey, uh, war stories. It's time for War Stories. Tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. So the reason I wanted to mention this is there's a there's a reason why even though I've had Prey for a while I've only been able to play about uh, it's really more like three or four hours, and that's because it had a crippling bug when I first got the game. Really? Yes, really nasty bug, and and various a lot of people experience the same bug, but not everyone. And so so it the, took a while to these aren't it. the mimics. This is <laughs> this, is, yeah, this is the game. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let Sorry. me explain kind of what was happening. So the game itself um, was set up so that. Um, it didn't really respect dead zones on controllers, is from what I understand is why this happened. Uh-huh. So if for depending on the age of your controller and how your controller is set up, it if it's not like a perfectly fresh new controller, it'll actually think that you're moving, like you're pushing the controller, the, the controller stick to move, like the, the left stick, even right. when you're not. So you're constantly sliding on the floor, oh, like, no. like you're on ice. And my feet aren't even moving, by the way. I look down, and it's just—it looks like you're sliding on ice. And sometimes it's—it's it's relatively quick, like your full walking speed. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's really slow. But it's very—it um, was very nauseating for me, an experience. I tried to play still like this, and I couldn't get very far because I was getting actually ill. I was actually were you playing on PC? Ill. I was. Pl- I'm playing on PS4. Oh, okay. And this is this was an uh, experience. This is a bug that that multiple PS4 users and some Xbox wow. One users um, experienced. See, I would expect something like that on PC because everybody's hardware is going to be a little bit different, and even your controllers are going to be a little bit different depending on what you're using. But that's that's pretty that's pretty damaging. And what got me was that this this was a bug that, and I went to the Prey forums. Multiple people complained about from the very first release, and they didn't fix it. They released version 1.01, didn't fix it, 1.02 and 1.03, and still hadn't addressed it. Hadn't even responded to people's comments about, hey, uh, what's going on? I can't play. What's happening? Um, There were some workarounds that people suggested to make it less impactful, I Mm -hmm. guess you could say, Mm -hmm. but it didn't really work for me. I mean, I couldn't play it. Maybe some people could deal with it. This is a game where you're you're encouraged to be stealthy and careful and and really pick your moments to move around. Yeah. And if you're doing that, that means you're going to be standing still. Right. At a lot of points, and on purpose because you're waiting for your opportunity to strike. Well, you can't stand still, so good luck. Uh. So it was very frustrating. It's not like it would get me killed; it would just make me feel sick. So um, and the the oddest part of it, though, was that the demo didn't have those issues for me hmm. at all. Hmm. So, and I actually bought the game based on the demo on the yeah, screen yeah, of the yeah. demo. Um, now the game this this issue has been fixed. Now it's been fixed in, in um, patch 1.04. Okay. So the current version of the game is is fixed. I'm not having those issues, um, but it is. It was troubling for me that I actually even waited two weeks before I even picked up the game on purpose because I know that um, it's a game that Bethesda published. They have a tendency to push games out before they're ready and to force their devs to push those games out. And they did so. And unfortunately, um, the game wasn't ready. I mean, it shouldn't have gone. This is the Gaming Meta. News and 
commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. And now it's time to transition into Doc's favorite subject, furries. Chris? <laughs> um, Chris, so. with the first owner report, <laughs> what is your fursona? Before we start this segment, let's take a, let's take a quick break. And hear everyone's personas. Uh, so, so Chris, what is your persona? I, I know Hedgehog, Doc. Right? <laughs> yeah, he's he's actually um, Sanic nine nine seven. Sanic nine nine seven. Yes. Yeah. Doc, what is your persona? Uh, totally a squirrel, man. Squirrel? Yeah. Okay, squirrel. Awesome. Yeah. You know, secreting things away. Big fluffy tail. I like it. Lives I in like trees. It. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'm gonna go with a raccoon. Hmm. I like it. I can okay. see that. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Great. Um, but no, no. But in all seriousness, we do have a gaming meta segment that does involve um, the Sonic fan base and Sonic, which of course is very has very strong support from the furry community. And I, I, I'm only kidding. Please don't turn us off. Furry fans. I, I, I do this out of love, Chris. <laughs> um, so Send Sonic your hate mail to hashtag Jim back. Yeah. Uh, Sonic Forces is coming out later this year. I think around Christmas time thereabouts, and. Um, they announced recently a new feature they're adding where you can actually create your own custom character to play in the game. Hmm. And so the running joke across the internet has been, you know, you can finally bring your Sonic fan fiction to life. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, the Sonic fan community is odd. Um, it's also very strong. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, and these characters that you're creating for this game, um, they're none of them are human, correct? They're all like yeah. They're all like like hedgehogs mm-hmm. or, or foxes. Or, and that's actually something that's kind of interesting about it because what this is doing is not just letting you kind of create an avatar to mm-hmm. be in the game. Um, so one of the interesting things about it is that you can actually choose from a bunch of different species, each of which has a different um, kind of special ability. No, oh, like raccoons. Uh, squirrels? No no raccoons, no squirrels, unfortunately. Oh, sorry, Doc. Um, we might be out of luck. <laughs> yeah. The ones they have are bear, bird, cat, dog, hedgehog, rabbit, and wolf. Um, I like how he just knew... Th- oh, no, he's reading this. <laughs> yeah, I am reading this. <laughs> um, no, I've just been like so into this news that I have memorized everything. Um but it, what it's kind of neat is that, like, you know, in the game, this is doing the same thing as Sonic Generations, where you have modern Sonic and classic Sonic. And so you've got, you know, one stage where you play more of the modern style, where there's, like, the behind, the over-the-shoulder third person running forward, um, sort of interspersed with side-scrolling segments. And then the classic Sonic, where you have the old-school controls and everything is side-scrolling. So the bird, if you have a bird character, you can actually have a double jump. Which is something that Sonic can't normally do. That makes sense. Um, and so you have like that one extra ability that might change the way you approach the level. Um, uh, Bear has a homing attack that you can use. The cat lets you keep one ring after being hit. So if you tend to take a lot of damage and you can't collect the rings quickly enough, um, you always have that one ring left over so you have a little bit more survivability. That's oh, okay. Thing. Wait, so are they also all very fast like Sonic? Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, so basically it just plays like Sonic, but with that twist of instead of having Sonic special ability, you've got your species special ability. Um, and then you can like do things like change the color, change like little accessories and stuff that you wear, that sort of thing. Um, to you can, create... dr- you can dress your fur persona. <laughs> yes, you Perfect. Can. Uh, to create your uh, original fan character, do not steal. Uh, <laughs> or no, it's just OC, do not steal. That's, that's what it is. So, there it is. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, just like a fun little bit of news that I thought was worth mentioning, uh, for all of you Sanic fans out there. Day one uh, buy for you, Chris? <laughs> it might be actually, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, in, in all honesty, I, I mean, I, I don't play Sonic and I'm not really a fan, but I also don't, I'm not, I'm not a Sonic hater. I'm mm-hmm. really not. Um, I think there's a lot of really good uh, material in there. I think it's clean. I, it's something that like my own kid, I could totally see him getting into. It'd be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like Sonic. I, I think, I think that whole franchise is well overdue for a nice revival. So mm-hmm. I'm happy to see this. I, I will say that if you think Sonic is clean, don't, Delve too deep into the internet searching for Sonic <laughs> Sonic imagery. Jim, are you I'm telling saying, me? Are you telling me that if I go deep into the internet, I'm going to find offensive things? <laughs> yes, but in particular on this one one subject, you will find a lot of them. I'm just saying, like we said, that like we just said, is... yeah. Chris knows what I'm talking about. It's like yeah. you, you can't avoid it if you start searching for searching on say Tumblr or some of these places for Sonic stuff. Well, believe it or not, <laughs> the old man is not completely ignorant. But um, all I'm saying is the core property itself I have a lot of respect for. Mm. And I think that uh, you know, I think it's time for a reboot. Mm. Good yeah. good old Sonic Revival. You gotta go fast. Now is the time for reading list in which our impeccable curators recommend the finest materials for your reading, 
listening and viewing pleasure. Superb wine. Okay, so I wanted to mention a rather interesting book that I found, where if you've been a long-time listener of the podcast, um, they make some really good points that I think will resonate with a lot of the stuff that we tend to say here, that we... It kind of summarizes conclusions that we often come to. It's called Hitmakers by Derek Thompson. Um, And I'm actually reading it for work for reasons I won't go into right now. But basically, they're talking about what it is that makes things popular, what makes things a hit. Um, You take, like, two very comparable products, say, like a movie or YouTube video or something like that. Which – what is it that makes one of them blow up and the other one just sort of fade away into obscurity? When you say hit, are you – you're referring specifically to entertainment products? Mainly entertainment products, yes. But it also applies somewhat to just product design in general. So, Like Coca-Cola? Yeah, sure. Okay. And what's kind of interesting about it is that one of the key points that drives through the whole thing is trying to deal with the psychology of consumers. Um, the the One of the big points is that people are inherently neophobic. They don't like new things, but they're also very neophilic. They do like This new idea things. is new, and I don't like it. But <laughs> I'm interested, so keep talking. Um, <laughs> and so it's about finding that balance between... Uh, having enough familiar things that people will latch onto it while also having enough new things to make it interesting to not make it boring. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, and exactly like the, the Sonic game you were just talking about a few minutes ago, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. Or, or yeah. just gameplay in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure. if you mess up with a gameplay on this great new property and you, it's so counterintuitive... Mm-hmm. You're not going to get deep enough into it to learn the mechanics and have fun with the game. Mm-hmm. Exactly. If something is too alien, people won't mm-hmm. be able to figure it out. Um, there's a lot of stuff about fluency and disfluency. Um, and they sort of like have different case studies about different things. Like They talk about, for instance, art um, and how um, impressionism came to be um, a popular art form. Because when it first started, it was you know very much looked down upon. It wasn't legitimate art. Um, and then it turns out that... The, the One of the points that he makes is that sort of people looking back at something that has already been a hit, they sort of talk about it as if it was always destined to be a hit, if that makes sense. It's kind of like the hindsight being twenty twenty. That's so true. Um, when, in fact, a lot of times the thing that kind of led to it being popular, um, of course, the inherent properties of the thing have something to do with it. But a lot of times it has something to do with some story that tells us um, why it was that – it happened. So, for example, with the Impressionism, it's because this guy put in his will that he wanted the uh, French Museum of Art, I forget exactly the name of it, mm. um, to display a bunch of paintings from his collection. The, the Louvre? Uh, it wasn't the Louvre. No, it was just like the National something or other. And so those paintings that got put up into that collection raised the public awareness of this. And it's also why those paintings in particular, even if they're not objectively better than a lot of other impressionist impressionist paintings, are the most recognized, the most popular, the most well-known, is because you can trace it back to the ones that got featured that sort of made the movement take off. Um, that's one of those examples of familiarity being the thing that makes things popular. Um, so there's a lot of interesting points, and he does a good job, too, of kind of you know, making statements, but also sort of putting a grain of salt on it, saying, like, this isn't the end-all answer. You know, there's a lot of sort of, like, cautioning and saying, um, like, there are extra explanations for this, or, you know, there's also a sort of a flip side to this as well. I want clear answers, (laughs) clear solutions. Yeah. (laughs) Unfortunately, it's not that simple, Uh, and that's part of what the book's about. Just go deep into the internet, Jim. You'll Mm -hmm. find it. Um, Some really interesting stuff, like the power of story, what makes (laughs) stories resonate with us, Um, why it is that, like, you know, certain myths will come to be, for example, he talks about vampires. Vampirism, um, and why vampires were for a while the like premier explanation for things we later came to know that was just like disease is what causes a lot of people to die in groups. Well, sort of I mean, we, we think. <laughs> We think it's another theory. <laughs> um, the, let's not alienate our vampire listeners. Yeah, let's please. let's agree to disagree and just say <laughs> vampires suck. <laughs> there we go. They do. We can we can all agree to that. But yeah, so the uh, the book again is Hitmakers: The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction by Derek Thompson. Uh, I tried to summarize it somewhat, but there's a lot more to it. Uh, I definitely recommend checking it out. Really interesting read, um, and I think that if you again listen to our podcast, you'll find a lot in it that um, resonates with what we tend to talk about here. Cool. Also probably available as an audiobook. It is. Yeah. That's actually how I'm going through cool. it right now. Awesome. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. I did want to mention one of the things that prompted this discussion. We've had this idea, or, or rather Doc and I have kind of been kicking kicking this idea around for 
probably a couple of months now yeah. at least. Yeah, whenever we first watched the series, it was about the same time, maybe right. a, a week or two apart. Right. You talked about it, I went and watched it, and we, we talked privately about it. And then we were like, you know what, we should we should have a show about mm-hmm. it, but let's wait. Let's wait because there's going to be a, a really high-profile Western game that comes out. And there's really not, to be honest with you, there's actually very few uh, video games that are set in a Western setting. I know, it's such a very lull. Few. Right. And one of the biggest ones, and I, w- I would argue the most high-profile Western video game, re- is Red Dead Redemption. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be a sequel, and there, it's been planned for some time, originally planned to come out this year. In fact summer of this year. Yeah. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, the big news is that Rockstar um, released a new trailer as sort of a consolation prize because they <laughs> they delayed the game a full year to spring of next year, spring of 2018. And, of course, I was very disappointed. I know Rockstar will do a great job when it does come out, but because they decided to delay the game, we figured, why wait? We'll go ahead and do our, our, our Westworld game simulation topic. Yeah, right away. Let's do it. Let's yeah. talk about it. So, for those of us like me who haven't seen Westworld, can we sort of summarize what it is that we need to know before we go I, into this? I think the the really the only important thing that we need to know because I don't want to get into spoilers or talk about the story. It's right. basically just um, it's a bunch of larpers <laughs> that it is a bunch of larpers yeah, that I are in that. that are inside a um, a Western style, an Old West environment where um, there's no danger of them being killed or injured because. All of the, quote, dangers are actually uh, robots, AI right. that has been programmed to, to – and very sophisticated AI that has been programmed to seem like they're um, a gunslinger or a bartender or a hooker or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, Soiled dove, Jim. Soiled dove. Sure, sure. Um, and so then that's really the, the whole idea. Now, now, in this world, though, there are quests. It's very much like an MMO-type oh, environment yeah. because there's other players – and there are also um, quests that you can pick up, and the quests are, are, are curated. They are designed by the game's designers. They're, right. One of one, the the biggest one being Anthony Hopkins, yes. is who plays well, the, the word the written is used. Ford, I believe. Um, in fact, even more more than design, I think they use the word written. They have a writer. There's a subplot about the writer. Yes, um, because they have multiple writers. Right, they do. Of. But the head writer, um, he, you know, the head writer a subplot is Ford. about that. Yeah. He's he's kind of a jerk, but. You know, there's really in, well. That's true. No, I don't mean him. There's the, oh, you mean the actual the other the, right? Yeah. yeah, I guess Ford is more of the um, the AI. Does, yeah, like the See, he takes he takes the, the he he creates these stories, and he took kind of a back seat to another writer, and then that writer gets you know defrocked, and he steps in and he takes back over the park and all that. We're getting into the story stuff, but that's not actually what we want to even talk about. Right. But what I what I loved were the moments in the show where. Uh, some some of the call them the control room. The people in the control room were looking. And they're like, "Oh, it looks like so and so guest has hooked up with the banditos this week." Mm-hmm. So that's going to be kind of interesting because the the bank robbery that happens every week, or in this case, it was the uh, it was like, it wasn't actually the bank. It was the uh, the what the. The cat house gets robbed. Yeah. The safe. Of I think the cat it house. was. I, yes, they, they they came in to to steal the safe from the like burlesque house. Yeah, or the or whatever cas- it was. casino yeah. or whatever whatever you want to call it. Um, it's all those. It things. was kind of both. It was yeah. like it was the, the bar, ho- the hotel, yeah, the quote hotel, unquote, hotel. That, right? Yeah. Um, and so every week that happens mm-hmm. on schedule. But for the guests that are there for that week, right? Right. So the idea is the guests come for a week and then leave. And Usually, then yes. Okay. But what's interesting is, and one of the things I think is really strong about the way they told the story is, it looks like the, some of the stories reset every day, some of the stories reset every week, and some of the stories reset every three to four days, and some of the stories only reset. In fact, I think it's arguable that all of the stories only reset. When whoever it is that's interacting with them completes the story arc, right? Or it's the, or if they lose interest, right? Because it also seems like if if no one picks up on that, because they they drop these little hints of of like story, right? It's like it's it's the hook. Oh, is this person going to pick up the hook? Like the one girl, I won't get into all this, but basically, she there's this one character, and her hook to get involved in her story is she drops a can, it rolls towards one of the players, right? And if they pick it up, they have this interaction with her, and if they're interested, they can go off and have this full long romantic storyline with right. her and they can learn more about her and there's various various character development and arcs that go find on find out why the why the farm is in trouble right. and why uh why there's a, a bad guy mm-hmm. who's after them but, and but all if they ignore things. it if they ignore that then she just repeats that same element that Every same little hook day. until someone picks it up and then 
off they go. And exactly. The quest happens. What's interesting is there's actually, um, and, and this is a little bit of a spoiler from the first episode, but there's actually another host. They're called hosts. The robot the robots are called hosts. Um, who, if no one else picks up the storyline, he does, and and that's on purpose because. Uh, the the guests can actually be bad guys, and and it, it's formed as a black hat white hat right. um, metaphor. Um, and what I really like about, and I don't want to get into that because you talked about that, gosh, about well, twenty episodes ago mm-hmm. uh, from, from, from our perspective. Um, so go back and, and listen to that episode where, where Jim talked about it. But uh, what what I like about that black hat white hat thing is the story adapts. And the individual characters, the hosts, adapt um, so that the player, the real people that are that are in Westworld, can have a sort of an authentic feeling experience. That might that brings us to the big question of the day: Can such a game be made now? Now, I'm not talking about robots in a park. Obviously, what I'm talking about. Ah, uh, I'm uh, disappointed. What I'm talking about is a video game, <laughs> right? I was what if to say LARPing does exist? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> kind of, I, I sort of, as a joke, mentioned it in that in that sense. But there are LARPing elements to it mm-hmm. because the the players are expected to. When you go, you're not allowed to bring in your normal clothing. You have to dress right. the part. You right. have to. You can't bring in modern equipment. You're supposed to use, you know, their guns yeah. and you know their their sort of equipment. You don't bring in like your smartphone because they didn't have exactly. smartphones back then. Well, and just in case somebody doesn't know, LARP stands for live action role play. Yes, which is um, a very specific type and, of, of role play. And, and the people that that go to this park, of course, are paying a lot of money. Right. So you're not going to want to spend a lot of money and then knock it into the part, knock it into the fun of the whole experience. Exactly. That, that would be silly. So uh, they all buy into it too. So there's this this experience. But like you're saying, to, to translate into a video game, could they make could we make something like that? And I think I think to me the closest. Obviously, the closest that we've come to things like that, it would be similar to a um, an MMO type MMO. environment, MMORPG. Oh, I'd love an MMO Western. That would be so that amazing. That would be cool as well. But the trick would be, and this doesn't have to be a Western, of course. Of course. But the trick here would be that you would have to have um, essentially dungeon masters, like game masters, like D anD D, that would be watching, like the people in the game, the designers in the game, that are mm-hmm. that are paying attention to what storylines are being picked up. Where are, the pl- where are the players going off to? What experiences are they having? And how can we make their experience better? Because what makes mm-hmm. what makes the experience and why people spend so much money to go to Westworld in this universe is not because, and so, for some of them it is, but it's not because they can just stay in the one little town and do like the few little experiences, interact with people right. in the one little town. It's because it's this giant space. And the reason that works is because there's people that are curating their experience every step of right. the way. Like you're, like you're explaining, they'll change. They'll, they'll, they'll just... Like, oh, the AI is going off and the person wants to do this. Okay, we'll just, you know, flip a switch and make the AI, like, slightly different and interact in this way and let them go off. And Because the players are basically treated as kings. I mean, kings right. and queens. They're able right. to do whatever they want in this Well, they're, they're immune. Um, so, really, they're, they're in God mode even. Right. Which is kind of interesting. And that's what really spawned the question for me is we play a video game. We expect to be able to die and then we reload or whatever. What if you were playing a video game where you literally couldn't die? Um. And that wasn't the point of the video game. The point of the video game was to explore the story in such a way that you want to stick around and try that story arc again the next day. Um, and, and specifically, not even – I would even argue it's, it's – you're exploring um, the, char- the character stories and character arcs. Yes. Because it's not even like there's, there's this big story that you're, that you're necessarily going to, going to explore in, in, this, in Westworld. Instead, uh-huh. it's – this character has something inter- interesting in their life. What's their life story like? And then you get involved in it. You know, and some of it even right. goes into this um, civil war. Not civil war. It's like Mexican civil war. I guess it is something mm-hmm, like that. Is mm-hmm. what it feels like. Um, again, very Western inspired. But it's it's that's a pretty big potential storyline yeah. right there. Of course, in the in the series in the first season of the series. It's hinted that there is a sort of a meta story, and sure. the the black hat is is after that. He, he's the guest who's been there the longest, right. and that sort of thing. And that you, was supposed to be something that you find out who he really is at the end, yeah. and and all that. And and that never really gelled for me. No, it was, very, it was very poorly done. It was, I, it was I badly done. But um, but I think that kind of an idea would be cool too. Um, even if you know if if it was completely acknowledged from the very beginning of this uh, hypothetical video game we're pitching here mm-hmm. that. You are entering into a simulation. The simulation that you are entering into, because that's really what we're talking about here. We are. Um, 
It's a sandbox. Yeah. It, it is very much a sandbox. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that, that in that simulation sandbox, um, there are things going on, and there's a deeper secret. And if, mm-hmm. you, if you play, you will be able to figure out what's going on. And, it, and it's presented as, and I think it's, it's layers of story. So the concept Correct. here would be, would be, you can explore just the, a few surface stories mm-hmm. and seek those out, or you can explore, you know, deeper stories that are interconnected to other stories and kind of just see where that takes you. Yes. It's, it's all up to the player to seek it out. Nothing is like they give you the hooks. Some sometimes they'll give you a hook, but it's up to the player to determine if they want to explore that story or not. Whereas in every video game that I've ever played. Yes, they have side quests that are like that, but there's always a, this is the driving force that you have to do in order to win this game. Mm-hmm. That's what, a video, what we think of as a video game. The main quest, in other words. Yes. Yeah. And all video games have that, that concept. If they don't have that concept, those are the sort of things that I almost don't even, a yeah. lot of times I don't even consider a game, because it's like, well, what's your objective? You don't even have one. You know, it's right? funny. There, there are mods what? for Skyrim which can turn the main quest off. Right. Right. For, for example. <laughs> and turn it into a, a sort of a sandbox world. I was thinking of something like Gary's mod. There you go. Oh, where, that's a great example. Right, where there is no there is no objective. It's yeah. literally just, you know, do whatever, make, make your own fun kind of mm-hmm. thing. I would mention Minecraft, but that's so very specific in the whole building yeah, idea. Yeah, exactly. The building I think part, that's I think misleading. Away. Yeah, um, I agree. But, you know, this, this idea of why do we play video games, I think, is intrinsically linked into this question. Um, and within the context of a simulationist model, which has stories, obviously, has, um, you know, hooks, quests, plots, that sort of thing, but you're not doing it for the XP. You're not doing it to level up. You're not doing it for any other reason than to explore that story. And then you know, as a conceit, it's going to reset tomorrow. You know, and maybe that's an in-game tomorrow, or maybe it's a real tomorrow, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you Maybe you reload the game, maybe you play it through one time, maybe you don't. There are different ways you could design this. But the, the real point here is that the, the way that you beat the game, quote-unquote, is by not stopping. It, right. you, you're, you, you never can win. There's no victory condition. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe there's an end game meta, maybe there's not. But really what it comes down to is it's a water cooler moment. And you and I are at the water cooler gym. We don't work at the same place, but let's pretend we do. Um, it's a water cooler moment, and I'm like, so have you done the Bandito quest? And you're like, yeah, I totally did the Bandito quest. I beat all those guys. I found their, their cave, and I took all their treasure. I'm like, no, no, no. You join them. And then as Banditos, you go and you hijack the train. Right. And you're like, I never thought of doing it that way. And we have this this really cool sort of talking about the – you can't even call them Easter eggs at that point, the details. I, I think we, we talked about it as an MMO, but I don't think it would work as an MMO the more that I think about it. Um, well, it didn't Westworld. But well, it didn't in Westworld because it wasn't massive. There's a difference there, yeah. Because oh, that's true. That's the point I'm going to make. Basically, if yeah. you're going to do it as an online game, the thought that I had is you'd have to essentially have like scheduled sessions – yeah. Where you would have like the, your moderator is going to be online during this period, and that's the period in which you're going to play. Uh-huh. Right. Um, in a way, it'd almost be like just you know, it'd be like Roll Twenty, yeah, where you exactly. get online that's and you play an of. RPG with people. You've mm-hmm. got the game master who's running this game for people, and you have like you you can have like you know six to maybe twelve at the max. Mm-hmm. But the more people that you add, the danger that you get into because someone else might say, "Well, I want to go on this Bandito quest. Oh, and I want to do it a different way." Well, that's of course the way that. Um, don't get me wrong. That, LARPs that, work. Mm-hmm. Sure, you, you totally. schedule them for a weekend, of yeah. course. But you also don't you don't LARP with you know seventy Seven, people, yeah. or like seven hundred people, right? You know, like you do with an MMO, you're in there with that many people. Yeah, you don't do that here. Seventy is actually be, quite doable, depending on the scale of the game. Mm. But and also, like, don't you kind of have a thing where people sort of uh, almost like a golf tee times, where you've got a group that like goes through a thing, and then the next group comes through after them. And so, like, you have the person who, like, I'm this NPC. Yes, and knows the, the easy answer to mm-hmm. that. Um, I guess like, kind of depends on the one. You know, you tend to have a, a we'll call it a party or a group mm-hmm. that that sticks together. If we're talking in LARPs here, mm-hmm. um, and then if there's a sort of an event, an in-game event, yeah, they'll schedule the groups for a specific time and bring them through right. that way. Right. Uh, but then there's also open stuff like like the the store or whatever. You know, you can go and you do, it. I, and you stay in character the whole weekend. You know, I think the way this game has to work, if if this were to be developed as a video game as a video game it would need it really would need to have 
someone that decides I'm going to be the GM. You need that. Mm-hmm. It couldn't be the game designers because there'd be way too many games going on at once. You need someone that has that curated experience. Well, sure. You need the curated experience. So so it would really bore. It would have to be like a very sort of in the same vein as Westworld is. Kind of like this weird new format in which like the developers actually do run it for you, but you have to schedule. It's like a much smaller audience at any given time because you actually have to schedule and possibly pay for the session they're going to run you. Right. Through. Yeah. Because and you would have to pay too because if Maybe. you're having. Yeah. No, I think you. Wow would. has servers. I mean, they, they no, have, but see, but that's not going to work, Doc, because in, in Wow you could have you can be running multiple people can be running the same quest at the same time. That's true. And that doesn't that wouldn't really work here. Well, if if the quest is unavailable because the character is unavailable because they ran off exactly. with the so-and-so, exactly. then that could just be a little more uh, immersive. And, that, and that's about um, but, but here's re- what, rethinking the way that we think about video games. Because if you go seeking out a quest and the person is not mm-hmm. there, we would, we would stand there until they respond well, in sure, World of Warcraft. Sure, but, but, here's, but the other part of that, too, is that if that person is off on that quest in mm-hmm. World of Warcraft... You can't go in there and then hijack that quest and turn it into a different, like, say, okay, oh, you're going to go rob the train? No, I'm going to stop you from robbing the train. Right. But in our game, you could do that. You could do that. So that's why you can't have a massive multiplayer experience. It has to be smaller because there'd be, there'd be chaos. Yeah, because you'd have everyone. Yeah, yeah. You'd have everyone trying to do everything at the same time. You would lose control. Well, you know, in the good old days, MMOs were 500 people. Or, or even 50. Yeah. yeah well, that's kind of funny. The other question I would have then, though, is do we necessarily need the live GM? Now, of course, that's going to give you the most flexibility, but in a computer game, how much flexibility do you really have anyway? So my question yeah. would be, like you mentioned, for example, the Bandito's Quest. It sounds like it's basically just like, are you playing the white hat or the black hat version of it? Right. But there's, and that's determined at the beginning of the quest. Yeah, no, but it's not. Because it's it, not. you can switch at any point. Oh, yeah. okay. You can switch it. And not just can you switch at any point, but also... Different characters can have different takes on it and can kind of change the outlook. That's right. Like there, there's it's a kind of a big part of the show where there's a couple of characters that have a different approach yeah. to Westworld. You can be a murdering black hat or you can be a kidnapping black hat. Exactly. And those are two very different things. And, okay. and you can like if you're if you're t- going together and one of them chooses to go that one route, well now you have to you have to deal with that mm-hmm. because yeah. they just made a choice and the character that maybe you were interacting with maybe he just killed him. Yeah. What are you going to do? Well. Too bad. You can't just go, well, I'm, I wanted to go this route. Too bad the character's dead. You can even be Figure a double agent and, mm-hmm. and, and turn, you know, join, join the banditos and then turn them all in mm-hmm. and that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, they actually had hired, let's call them actors, mm-hmm. um, puppeteers might be a better mm-hmm. better term for it, um, who interacted with it. I'm also brought back to the, the golden age of the alternate reality game, which I did my dissertation on. Mm-hmm. Um, Davis City was one of mine. And... What we did with that one, or rather um, what what I did with that more than anybody else as the head writer, was I controlled about eight different characters. And when people private messaged those characters, they, that came to me. Mm-hmm. And then I responded in character as that character, a bit like a GM would do. Mm-hmm. But it, it was a different kind of conceit because we're not pretending like the GM is a character. The technology barrier there literally let me... Uh, act as those characters without them knowing mm-hmm. who the puppet master was. Right. Me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I think back to, and I, and I actually don't know that much about the, the Matrix, but I do know that it got uh, cost prohibitive mm-hmm. and that they shut the whole thing down as kind of a live event and they the servers crashed because so many people logged on mm-hmm. that they didn't see the big destruction of the world. Mm-hmm. And they all got booted right before it happened, yeah. which was so mm-hmm. ironic. Um, but what was neat about that is Maybe you're going to run into Neo. Maybe you're going to run into Morpheus. Maybe you're not. Mm. Because they might or might not be on at that time. Mm. So what you're talking about with, with like scheduling the actors to be on there, that kind of a thing, mm. I think there's a huge key to this if this is going to work. And that it has to feel natural and be emergent. Mm. And, and I think that, that whole can rolling across the ground to your feet moment, if, if you go seeking that out, that's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. So I guess what... Another sort of one-off question of this is, it's not just can we do it technically, but can we accept it socially mm. as gamers? Would, be, we, I, would I we be willing to do this? And again, way, I go back to World of Warcraft. Yeah, in a way, I was going to compare it to the RP servers on World of Warcraft, yeah. where Good. you have to have people who buy into the RP server. Mm-hmm. Right. And once you're there, in theory, everyone's bought into it and actually trying to role play. But those are also very small servers and very few compared to just the standard. I played player. on an RP server. I, I, I got to say, it was pathetic. Mm-hmm. I played on an RP server as well, and it, yeah, it did get. It wasn't 
good. <laughs> they didn't do a good job. But I think I think part of that is because I know you're saying it was smaller, but those servers were still huge. And yeah, right. I think that's that's an issue too. There were fewer of them. Yeah, mm-hmm. there, were, there were just less servers, so they yeah. just clumped clumped all the people that wanted to RP into like two or three servers versus yeah. all the other ones. But I think it, you have to approach it more like a tabletop role playing. Yeah, that's yes. what I thought. Mm-hmm. With with you, so it, when you play a tabletop role playing game, you get people together that you know are going to buy into your game. Mm-hmm. And if they're not going to buy into your game, well, then you just go, okay, well, then either we're not going to play the game, or you tell me what kind of game you want to play if I'm the GM, and then I say, okay, then I'll. I'll make a game you can buy into. Yes. That's the whole point. You have to do that. So if we have that curated experience where there's there's the one person that's like, okay, these people want to play this style of game, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, maybe it's robbing the train or what have you, then that's the experience they're going to get. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to have that, mm-hmm. that aspect of it. And I think that also in order to get that across, because essentially – what you're doing when you're role playing is this, but you're just sort of choosing the one path, or you're sort of making something up on the fly if you're the GM. It has to be making it up on the fly because, um, and that's the key of this is that there isn't the. It cannot be binary. Yeah. It cannot be the. Oh, I'm going to take. I'm going to be Renegade, or I'm going to be Paragon. Right. Right. No, because that's um, terrible. And so I hate you, Bioware. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, send your hate mail to Jim Bag. So either if you're doing it as an RPG, you know, if we're trying to highlight the fact that these things reset, they need to be playing an RPG where you're explicitly looping. Yeah. And you're having the resets and letting the players try different things each time. The other thing is that we could potentially make just like maybe a single player, maybe like a small group, you know, video game out of it Mm -hmm. and have maybe like shorter scenarios with just really advanced branching where there are a lot of things you can do at multiple times to give you the most open feel you can yeah. mm-hmm. without it being truly open. And, and part of what they had there, too, was that they would have um, they would have stories running, and yes, they would have some stories that would be short and would be repeatable, mm-hmm. but they would also come up with new stories all the time. That was mm-hmm. why they had mm-hmm. the writers. Mm-hmm. So that's part of it, too, where you, know, you have people come in, they, they play through whatever stories they want to do with the multiple branches, mm-hmm. and then there's new content, then there's new stories. Well, to World of Warcraft's credit, they've done some of that. Um, uh, like, for example, the big uh, cataclysm mm-hmm. comes to mind. You can't play in the old world anymore on the old map. Oh, you it's, mean world-changing event? Yeah, it's true. just gone. That's true. Now, now on, on the granular level that you're talking about, it's not there. But I guess the question becomes, at well, what point does it feel that way so much that it doesn't matter because it's still my own personal here, experience? Here's the thing. If, in order for it to be like actually like Westworld yeah. and, and have this real, I can I can do what I want in this, in this game, but have the experience that I want to have. Right. You need to be able to, to go to that, you know, the bandito or whatever that wants to rob the train, and you need to be able to go there to start like you're going to start the quest, and then stab him in the back and kill him right. in the middle of it. That's right. You have to have that option. And in something like World of Warcraft, you do not have that option. No, you start the quest based on your alignment, and then you have to finish the quest or fail it. And if if you can kill that, that quest giver... Uh, there, of course, are some characters that you just can't kill. Yeah, but they're just you, too high level or whatever. But if you can kill that quest giver, you just fail the quest in World of Warcraft. There's no, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's no, um, now you've changed it into a different sort of quest. And, that's, and that's what I'm saying that's, about having that's the, the, the really advanced branching system is you would need to take into the account that it is more a simulation than a storyline, yes. if that makes sense. And, and we keep saying MMORPG, and it's not... Our, we need to remove the RPG, the RPG part because right. there's no like the the RPG element is there in the sense of you are you are accepting a role and you are playing that role that you mm-hmm. choose mm-hmm. within this world, but there isn't there's not levels there's not statistics correct it's not mechanically an RPG correct but it isn't from a narrative standpoint an RPG right mm-hmm. so that's something to keep in mind too yeah that that makes a lot of sense yeah mm-hmm. um, you you shoot your gun at the bad guy he's gonna die he shoots it at you. You're not, if we accept the the Westworld conceit that you can't die. Everyone's immortal. But see that I think, I think again that that kind of goes back to the tabletop gaming experience because depending on the sort of people that you're playing with, mm-hmm. you might be in that exact same experience where mm-hmm. you're accepting. We're all meeting to play. If I if I let you your character be killed off and I'm not, we're not going into something where I just let you reroll a new character. Yeah. I'm not going to let that happen because yeah. otherwise, because then now, guess what? We've been playing this game for like four months. All of a sudden, yeah, you're just not invited anymore. Your character's it's over. dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's done. Yeah, that's pretty. I mean, that's pretty harsh. Of course, a really great GM <laughs> is going to make um, every session feel like um, you came really close to dying, but didn't. Right. But see, or, and, and it's not always dying. Right. It, it, you know, there there are other things too. But that's a suspension of disbelief for for the player too, right? Because you accept, you, you buy into that, but you also accept. 
on some level, you know, you're not really going to be killed off, at least right. not permanently. Or if so, there's going to be some sort of like, okay, you're dead, but uh, now you have this other character that is basically the same thing. You can play it however you yep. want. So it's a little, and, and, that, and we could do those sort of rules here too, where you can quote die in this game, but you can yep. come right back as the same character. You're still yourself. You can do the same thing, but your character just failed whatever it was doing, and now you're back. Yeah. Well, we have to remember, of course, that the reason narratively, because ultimately Westworld is a, is a narrative. <laughs> it's not actually a game. It's about a game. Uh, but it's a narrative. And so they, they make some interesting decisions with what we would call gameplay decisions for the sake of the, the overarching narrative. And the reason why the guns don't work and they can't shoot you is because later on they do work. And then they, they shoot people. Right. <laughs> and so that was that was the point of that. <laughs> Um, well, and also because people are paying to go there and have a fun experience, not to be killed. So well, yes. there's, there's that yes. aspect of it, too. It's but, just there, there, you know, there are other ways to do that. You could use paintballs, for example, and then you remove yourself. Um, you reset yourself. You go to hospital. You know, whatever. Uh, but but that, see, that's another part of that experience that they're paying for. Is they're paying to basically have this... They're paying basically to be gods. Right. They're paying to, yes. they're, they're paying to do whatever they want in this space. And that's, of course, one of the major themes of the Westworld show. Right. Yeah. They're not they're not paying to be challenged. Right. To put so it that way. My question at is, least at least not physically, maybe mentally, maybe there there's a challenge of like solving a puzzle or something or getting to the end of a storyline, but they're not being challenged to, you know, survive this bandit attack. Brilliant observation. Yeah. So when we compare it to something like Prey, hmm. right, which we were talking about earlier, um, the thing about Prey is you are solving puzzles. I haven't played it, so I'm, I'm mm-hmm. assuming here, based on your description. You're solving puzzles, but there could also be a mimic that comes up behind you and eats you, and you could die. Sure. So we, within the game space, traditionally, the video game space, we expect both of those things to coexist. It's the ludonarrative um, balance, if you will, right? Right. And if you do it wrong, it's a ludonarrative dissonance. So what I'm saying is, could we do it in a video game space, as Westworld depicted it, with out the ludo narrative dissonance coming into play and us getting incredibly bored very very quickly and then going over and playing Red Dead Re- Re- Redemption because <laughs> we can shoot people and, and possibly get killed and, and there's a real and danger and that's why I think that if and the adrenaline's going, flowing if we're going with the video game route I kind of see it being one of two things one is the very like kind of weird new experimental format mm-hmm. where it'd probably be kind of an indie thing I would guess oh, yeah. where like you have someone who's designed this game experience and they will run you through it and that's kind of like when you buy the game you're buying that session and you sort of play through it maybe once or twice if you don't mind the repeat but that's just kind of like the thing you're doing oh you're reminding me of an escape room right now yeah. you, you buy an hour actually, yeah. of an escape room and, and mm-hmm. you and your friends try to get out and you yeah. might fail and mm-hmm. you know yes that's actually that's a good comparison I was going to say the other comparison for this would be because we keep talking about all of the you know, the problems with the AI and, and, and trying to make sure that, that there's someone managing all of it. The other possibility is literally just player is, like, someone accepts the role of every single player in the space. I mean, every single character in the space. Mm-hmm. And then it's just, you're playing the role of that character within the space. Right. And then that way, literally, you can do it, like, you can do anything and they can react in any way because it's, it's actually a person. Well, that's a really good point. And that's the other possibility is that everyone pl- is playing like, there are no NPCs. That's They're how, all PCs. That's how they demo new, R, uh, you know, RPGs. That's and, basically, and yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah, basically, online has that. Oh, if, good if it's point. All just like player on player, like any drama that comes out of that game is the interactions of players with each other. Yeah. Um, so we need, we need. You're saying that we need Excel. We need to add Excel to this. Oh, <laughs> yes. <my>. yes. <laughs> um, but the other thing that kind of comes to mind too for me, if you're taking the video game approach, is my head keeps going back to Majora's Mask, mm. um, where any given run through the three days, you could choose to address or not address any Good of the side quests. Good comparison. Um, and I'm kind of thinking, like, what if we took the Majora's Mask idea, but instead of making it, and then you know, maybe there is kind of the Okay, let me put it this way. We're not trying to loop enough times to do the one thing each time that collectively means you can finish the quest. Each time you're just kind of seeing like what can happen within this time mm-hmm. space. So like, have, like Groundhog's Day mm-hmm. as well, right? Like yeah. you have like one, yeah. one yeah. small amount, a uh, period of time mm-hmm. where you can where the world is going to go through all these different paces. Mm-hmm. You can do all these different things in all these different ways. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, either the moon shifts mm-hmm. or you know, the day the day changes and now it's like six AM again or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. And now everything resets. Yeah. And now you have to do it all. And you're trying to see again. what whatever my objective is for this run, 
like everything's going to kind of go and do its thing without your interference and where you interfere things start changing and there are dependencies where if I do this thing with this person then that's going to change what this person does over here and eventually you can kind of explore all the possibilities and you just have to like have this really deep again the advanced branching um, really well thought out what all could possibly happen in this like one two three day space in this environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to of, be able to punch Phil Connors in the face. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that would take a lot of thought, but I think that would probably be the most doable thing right now if you're trying to make a single or small group experience in a video game is to just make a small time frame as deep as possible. And that's actually one of the things that I was doing with my, um, my graduate thesis was I was attempting to make something that you can sort of explore in a different way each time. Now, granted, it was smaller scale, and I wasn't trying to be too ambitious with it, but that was the direction I was going in, is letting the player, each time they play through, have a different narrative experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's really what we're asking hmm. above all else here, is can we chuck away um, the RPG elements, I like the way you said that, Jim, and still maintain this simulationist model and the narrative for the sake of the narrative within the conceit of repeatability mm-hmm. um, and keep interest, I think is, and, and, or rather it, it'd be fun. Mm-hmm. I, I think is, is the real thing. Cause if, if we did this as an MMO, we'd need this group subscribers not to go away. Mm-hmm. And I think <laughs> that it, would be hard. I too. mean, this might just be me, but I think there's a huge appeal in a game that meaningfully reflects your decisions. And so if yeah. every time you play through, you see that, like, I did this thing differently and everything changed, then that right there is going to make you want to keep replaying it you to see what? what you can possibly That do. is so huge to me. The false choice. I am sick <laughs> of the false choice in video games mm-hmm. where you, you try for that second run through and you realize, no, I just I'm, I'm making different decisions. But fundamentally, I'm telling yep. the exact well, same story. It, it's that that is, is annoying. And the other, the other thing that's annoying is the, the binary choice. Yeah. Where. It's essentially the same thing. It's just instead of having just that one choice that they railroad you into, you have kind of two, and you're still kind of doing the same thing, but just with like a little bit of a different flavor right. on it. And um, like, and that's you know, Bioware's Renegade Paragon system. Yeah. I mean, same deal. It's just it's it's frustrating. Those aren't really choices. You yeah. know, in, in, the, no, in real life, not. our choices are not good or evil. It's not a binary thing. It's all of these different possibilities, all these different shades. Great. Yeah. If I'm like, okay, it's not like I can choose to. Um, I can choose to, you know, go go to this meeting at work and or, and you know, give this presentation really well, or I can go into my you know boss's office and punch him in the face. Those aren't my two options. Mm-hmm. I could also choose to go into the break room and eat eat a whole bunch of ice cream and just sit there and eat ice cream for like no reason whatsoever. You know, you could do anything in an actual real world situation, but in a video game, you're only giving a few options because of course it's difficult to program in all those choices. And I think when we're talking about is this possible. Um, the amount of choice that you would have to program and the amount the amount of possibilities i think i don't know if that i don't think that's something that we can do unless you have a lot of human input mm-hmm. like we can't really do it with ai because of all not just not just that you would be programming the ai to do all of these different things but you'd also have to have the world set up to accept all of these different Possibility. That's a really good point. And now, like, you know, on a sort of a, a microcosmic scale, talking about that example you just gave about going to the office and giving a meeting, you know, say you're in the office building for this day. Right. And you know that at 1230, you're supposed to be in this room to give this presentation. But because it's sort of running in real time and you're in control of your character, uh, it's not a pop up saying, do you want to go to your meeting now? It is. I either walk into that room and then that triggers an event or I choose to go into the break room and eat ice cream. And then basically the event is missed and then there are consequences for missing that event. Yeah, sure. Of course, in video game spaces, this gets difficult because sometimes – I'll take Bully for example, which I loved that game. I thought it was great. But if you're in town and class is starting, you've got like 30 seconds to get to class. That's not realistic. And it's a scaling thing. But, I mean, you jump on your skateboard and and, and you can get there in three minutes – which is also not realistic, but you know what I'm saying? There's, yeah. there, there's, there's conceits we make for video games mm-hmm. that, that are there. Um, a, a point you, you brought up just a second ago made me, me think in a direction, and I, I was getting ready to say that it's going to be really important for us not to know who the players are and, and who the um, hosts, to use the same term, uh, are. Mm. In other words, the guests and the hosts. And then I, I rethought that, and I realized that in the Westworld series – Everybody knows who the hosts are and who the, the guests are. They don't even tell us how they know, 
But it's well, somehow very for, apparent. For one, for, well, they, they know a couple of ways. Uh, probably the biggest and most important way is that um, the hosts are essentially supermodels. They are. Male or female. Yeah. They're all like basically designed. Now, now that's not entirely true. I guess some, there are some characters that are that are older mm-hmm. on purpose. They're they're made to look like you know like older, or, or they're or they're grizzled and scary they're grizzled in some or, way, but, right? But they're archetypes. How about that? Yes, they're archetypes. And and whereas a, a person that, that is in this world is just looks like a, like just a random a person you might person. see on the street, that's and true. they don't have like um, if they're if they're the characters in Westworld that are ugly are distinguished ugly. And yeah, stuff. that's true. Like, they have this really gruesome scar. And in this world, you're not going to have a gruesome scar because you're in the future, and people don't have gruesome scars. walk around with gruesome scars. Right, you know? sure, yeah. It doesn't happen. You get... People have surgery or whatever, and uh-huh. they, they, they fix themselves up. Or they don't get scars in the first place because you don't live in the Old West. Uh-huh. So, so, yeah, I think that's how they know that. And then, plus, I think the interactions, because even in Westworld, there's limits to what people can do. It's true. The characters are... If, you're, if your character is, you know... A hooker that works in the hotel. Um, so Dove, Jim. Yes, sure. What, what's your name, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> so so Dove, Jim. Sure. Uh, they're going to have certain skills and abilities and knowledge about certain things, and if you start taking them off off script, uh-huh. as something that they might say, um, it's going to become apparent that they're not actually. That they're not You're actually saying they're person. failing the Turing test. Yeah. Interesting. In some See, ways, I, they I do. hadn't thought about it in that way, but oh, you may be right. Yeah, they do fail, and, and at the very end, I think. Well, forget that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they, they fail. They fail. It. They fail. It. That, that's anyway, a good point. Don't worry about it. They well, do. in many ways, the, the master story arc of the first season is about the Turing test. Yeah, in in many many ways, um, which is interesting because there, are, all throughout, there are hidden. Let's call them hidden characters who both are and aren't who you think they are, which is interesting. Right. But um, I, I guess. Yeah, I guess I would completely backpedal on what I was going to say originally, which was that we shouldn't be able to know the difference. I think if this is really going to work, we have to know the difference and and know the difference between, let's call them, using the conventional terms, a PC and an NPC, mm-hmm. a player character and a non-player character, um, the hosts being the, the NPCs in this case. And there, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it happens, but... There's almost like this implication that if two PCs were to essentially attack one another, like in a real dangerous way, that they'd yeah. be thrown out. That's that's what I feel like would happen. That makes sense because it's the the whole space is meant to be this playground. Where it's a can, fantasy, right? Yeah. And if you're paying all this money, and then like one person decides, and, and not to say that people don't okay, like there are, there are some player characters that hit each other, mm-hmm. but if they were actually physically like. I'm going to kill this guy kind of thing. I, they there cuz there's people monitoring. They would kick someone out. Somebody oh, yeah. would be kicked out. Yeah. There'd be some cuz you're you're not there to, it's not a place where you can kill other people. Right. It's you can kill the host, but you can't kill other Yeah. Other people, so. And it's weird because um, you know, sex is a big part of it as well. Mm-hmm. And, and and including violent sex and deviant sex and mm-hmm. weird things like that. So it it as I was watching it, I thought of that scenario. It was like um, you, you're both walking out, going home, and you look over and you see this person. You're like, wait a minute. I thought I thought you were one of the hosts. Well, I thought you were one of the hosts. Oh, no. What, what just happened? Or, you know, that kind of a thing. But it, I guess one of the great things about the series for all of its faults and scars is there's things they don't explain. They don't explain how the weapons work. They don't explain what the robots are made out of. They don't explain how the software works beyond the, the points that are made within the narrative. They don't explain. They don't explain. They don't explain. I don't think they could. Yeah. And I think that's important, that they don't try to. Um, it just is. We accept it. This is the story they're telling in this world. They move on. And I loved that. I thought that was great. I also liked the little shout out to the original movie, the 1970s movie, when they go down into the basements. So you can actually see <laughs> some of the old yeah. stuff. That was that was a fun little Easter egg. But but yeah, for this, I mean, to answer the general question of, of could this be done right now, I still don't think it could. I guess you're right. Um, just because of the the advanced the how advanced the AI would have to be and the world would have to be for this to be a video game for this to actually work. Very true. Um, Very true. You know, I wrote an essay on the idea of relationships with fictional characters. Mm-hmm. I I called it ficto personal relationships, mm-hmm. and um, it it was really a lot of fun to talk about that um, because I, I did it in a in a transhumanist in, uh, environment, <laughs> and, and that's the the book that it was published in is a collection of essays and transhumanism and this idea of, of having relationships with 
fictional people. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about Siri like it's a she when really we're supposed to call it an it. Yeah. But the truth is, I don't have a relationship with Siri. She's too dumb. But there are there are um, people have been experimenting over the past you know decade or so, mm-hmm. with, and I'm sure you, I'm sure you're aware of this f- mm-hmm. from doing this paper with AI that you can chat with. Yeah, that that they're trying to make it as realistic as possible, right? And be able to learn different things about you as you as you communicate. Like they uh-huh. might learn, oh, mm-hmm. you're interested in this subject, okay, and they pick up different you know things about yes. about that subject as you talk to them about it. So, so the issue here is that we're still in the infancy of that. Like oh, that's we, very it's true. literally just um, text. Like yes. it's, it's yes. we can do that element of it, but all the and even that is limited. Yes. So we're we're a long way to go for it to feel like a real relationship and actually be able to yes to go beyond just simple text. Yes, and I actually talked about that in the essay uh, yeah. that that some of the the role play pseudo role play, if you will, that happens in like social media spaces, things like that, like the the all the things that happened with uh, Tebow. If you remember all of those, he had a fake girlfriend who was really a guy, <laughs> and right, and that wasn't that was that, that wasn't was, Tim Tebow though. That was another player. Oh, was it? Yeah. somebody else. Um, it was. Oh, I forgot the guy's name. Anyway, it d- doesn't matter. Yeah, doesn't matter. And, and then there was um, there was like the, the whole catfish thing, which became a series yes. later. Mm-hmm. That's a really interesting movie, by the way. It is, uh, especially since the whole thing is just totally fake mm-hmm. in and of itself, which is which is wonderful. Um, but but these kinds of things, you know, you go to a con and an actor comes and portrays their character at the con. What is that? You know, that's that's ficto personal communication, ficto personal relationships, is that we all, for a moment, we snap into character and we play, we role play in that space and in that moment. And I think there's some serious meat there moving into the future. I think this is the future of game design. Whether whether we use people to role play in that space in real ways that are real human relationships, or we are able to get the AI to a place where it feels that way, um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I, I think... I think there's something there, and, and we're going to need to talk about this some more. Yeah. I think, yeah, um, I think so because we're out of time. But man, <laughs> yeah, not to good side, stuff. Not to sidetrack us, but you know, one of the things about that is I've I've given a lot of thought before about how would I do like a digital tabletop RPG where you have a GM who's actually building instances and stuff like that for you as you go. Yeah, um, there's some design challenges with that, but I mean, I think that that's something that might not be too far off the horizon either. You know, having kind of like a Roll20 sort of idea, except it's in a digital space. Sure, yeah. So, Well, and there's such a difference between Dungeons & Dragons. Let's let's pick on 4th edition. Mm-hmm. Um, D&D 4 is basically a very complex board game mm-hmm. versus something like a, a, a diceless... I don't know. You can you can get into you can get no, into. No, I was I was going to disagree that it's. Co- I was going to say it's not that complex. Well, okay. <laughs> for, for a, fourth edition, it, yes, it, it's, it's complex. It's for a, it's if you compare it to board Descent game. or something, you know, compared to yeah. other dungeon crawls, it's it's more complex. The, yeah, okay. the, the character that. creation I'll give is you more that. complex. Yeah. Uh, but as compared to um, some of the more open, especially indie space tabletop RPGs, which focus more on narrative and storytelling, and, and rather than mm-hmm. the, the crunchy. You know, orc slang, mm-hmm. um, and and I think that's important to distinguish. Mm-hmm. Is that whenever we're talking about that spectrum, we're talking about the difference between those. And again, that's what we've been talking about with this Westworld pitch. Mm-hmm. Is something that doesn't try to be an MMORPG. It doesn't try to be a LARP. It mm-hmm. doesn't try to be these other things. It's got sort of the the best of all possible Westworlds. <laughs> See what I did there. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode 101 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Our discussion on is a Westworld possible? <laughs> I don't know. That question is still uh, up in the air, I think. Um, anyway, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Needle Nose Ned the Head, which is... <laughs> yeah, you, you get that reference yeah, there, Jim? Yeah. yeah, okay. See, look, look it up. You, you can Google it, but really I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Compatible.